Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Uh, first, thanks for everybody uh, for attending today's webinar. My name is Bill Mulligan. I'm the uh, CEO of Cordium US and Cordium Software. Uh, for those of you who don't know that are on the phone that don't know, Cordium is a global regulatory compliance uh, consulting and software firm. We've got about 200 people working at offices in New York, Boston, San Francisco, London, Malta, and Hong Kong. Um, I think a couple of preliminary points before we get started today. Uh, one, uh, really encourage people to ask questions. You'll see on slide four um, where how you can go about actually asking your questions, where you will be able to go to the GoToWebinar console, put a question in there, and we will do our best to get it answered. Um, we are also recording uh, the entire webinar today, today um, and the slides will be available um, either later this evening or tomorrow um, on our website at www.cordium.com. So with that, we will jump right into the presentation. Uh, the agenda for today, um, and you see the topic for today is really should ERAs, exempt reporting advisors, be thinking about the possibility of an SEC exam? And if that answer is yes, uh, how should ERAs prepare for that? Um, and you can see our agenda today. Uh, we're going to start really sort of with the regulatory landscape, sort of set the stage. We'll revisit some things. I'm assuming we've got quite a few people on the line today that are actually exempt reporting advisors or ERAs. We'll sort of go through what they are, um, what do they have to do. Um, we'll then sort of get into, quote unquote, what is the present buzz and why is there a present buzz? And this is around at least the, the possibility of such ERAs being subject to routine exams. Uh, we'll then go through just some other issues that are of note around the SEC ramping up its examination resources. We'll walk through the mechanics of, of uh, what one would expect if you were subject to a routine SEC exam, and this will be really uh, measured against uh, advisors that are actually registered with the SEC. You'll see me note a number of times throughout today's session that we would expect that exams applicable to exempt reporting advisors, if they were to be examined, would be likely quite a bit less. Um, then we'll sort of say, we'll go through what should an ERA uh, do to prepare, and um, we'll go through what we think are likely focus areas to the extent that ERAs were to be subject to an exam, although obviously it's going to always be uh, unique to the type of firm that the particular ERA is. So with that, we'll jump into the regulatory landscape. I think hopefully everybody knows when we refer to the term ERAs, we're talking about exempt reporting advisors. And exempt reporting advisors, or for lack of a better term, a creature of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act that was originally adopted back in June 2011 and required ERAs to start reporting to the SEC by March 31, 2012. Um, advisors that do meet the definition of an ERA, and we'll go into that in a second, are not actually required to register or are they required to come into compliance with all of the requirements of the Advi Investment Advisors Act of 1940, but they are required to submit regular reports, and we'll talk about it in a couple of slides, there are certain things that they need to address within the operation of their own compliance program. So with that, what is an ERA? Um, and as you can tell by exempt, it's basically there are two categories, generally speaking, of advisors that are exempt from sort of the broader registration requirements that Dodd-Frank brought into play, and those are advisors to venture capital funds, and advisors solely to small private funds with less than $150 million in assets under management. I'm not going to get into the definitions of either of those. Um, one thing I would uh, note, it is important to note, um, that the, the application of the second one, which would be advisors solely to small private funds, is slightly different uh, evaluation when you're evaluating it um, for advisors that, that are non-U.S. advisors that don't have a principal place of business in the United States. So the, the result of that is there are a lot of non-U.S. advisors, and the only way they advise any sort of U.S. money is solely through private funds um, that are ERAs, and all of them would not have any place of business within the United States. 
So we've sort of talked about this fact that we now know that we've got these ERAs. They're not required to register, but they are required to submit regular reports. What are these reports? Well, that report is in essence a portion of the ADV. The ADV is a form through which not only um, ERAs report, but advisors actually register and update their registration um, um, with the SEC. Um, but ERA is only required to, to complete a much more limited part of the ADV. Um, and we put up on the screen the, 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 the sections of the ADV, ADV that uh, ERA is required to complete. Uh, item one, which is certain identifying information, a little bit more routine information. Then there's a specific section of item 2B where they need to note they are actually in ERA and reporting as such. Then they will need to complete form uh, item three, which is about sort of the, 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 the form or structure of the firm's organization. They will then also have to complete item six, which contains certain information about their other business activities. Um, item 7A, which is any sort of financial industry affiliations they have. They will have to complete item 7B and the related schedule with that around their private fund reporting, which means they're gonna to have to give information in the reporting filing to the SEC about the various private funds that the firm advises. They'll have to complete item 10, which is disclosure of control persons, which in essence is specific disclosure about around the owners of the exempt reporting advisor, as well as certain officers of the exempt reporting advisor. And they're gonna to have to complete item 11, which is disciplinary information around not only the owners and officers of the advisor, but other employees. So ERAs need to really make sure that they've got mechanisms in place not only to gather all this information, but they have either a team of people working on it to make sure that they can update that because ERAs, similar to SEC registered advisors, are required to update um, their ADV on an annual basis. Now that takes us to sort of, let's say, a, a quick review of some of the more substantive pieces from a compliance procedural perspective. Um, I guess the one thing that is not covered on the slide, but I say at the outset, is that exempt reporting advisors are not technically required um, to appoint a CCO, but if they do not otherwise have a CCO, they must appoint um, a regulatory contact. That would be somebody at the firm that would be a, a contact for the SEC in a regulatory scenario. Uh, I would say um, it is, uh, you know, you will see instances where ERAs, notwithstanding the fact they're not required to appoint one, will actually go out and appoint a, um, um, a chief compliance officer or a CCO. From a substantive perspective, um, as it relates to, um, uh, you know, different types of procedures, exempt reporting advisors are not required to have any sort of written policies and procedures covering advertising, covering issues around the custody rule. They're not technically subject to the custody rule and it relates to you know many firms who comply with the custody rule via the delivery of audited financial statements that meet certain requirements within a certain time period. They're not subject to the cast solicitation rule. They are not subject to the proxy voting rule. They are also technically not subject to the code of ethics requirements. And in particular under that, they are not required, uh, at least technically required, to have their access persons or employees file certain personal securities transaction reports, file pre-clearance reports, have links to their brokerage accounts. Um, as I inferred earlier when I talked about the sections of the ADV that they're required, they're not actually required to be subject to the ADV brochure rule. So they only really answer those limited sections of the AD, ADV and they do not have to have the sort of more illustrative brochure about what types of investments are made, what are the risks in the business, who are the key people are doing it. At the end of the day, they're probably going to have that from a practical perspective because they're going to be managing funds that more often than not should have a PPM and they will have similar disclosures, but they don't need to do it in the form of, of the ADV Part 2B. They're also not technically subject to the privacy requirements or record keeping requirements under the Advisors Act. They might uh, very well be subject to other 
privacy requirements other under other legislation. Um, ERAs should have policies and procedures to cover general fiduciary obligations, um, insider trading prevention, general duty to supervise its people, um, pay to play, and anti-fraud among some others, and those are the most major ones. In particular, um, um, uh, exempt reporting advisors should on some periodic basis, and, and in theory it should be on an annual basis, make sure they've got a policy and procedure to review their business to ensure that they still comply with all of the requirements to be deemed an exempt reporting advisor. Um, I would tell you right now, and I think it's um, you know what you do see, and I would say you see it more often than not um, um, in ERAs that are eligible to be an ERA because they solely advise small, you know, small private funds with smaller assets under management, i.e. less than 150 million, where they will think about actually holding themselves to the higher SEC registration requirements. Um, and I sort of threw the question out there, um, should you, should your firm do it? Um, I think we see that more often with firms that think that they're actually going to grow their assets under management in such a way that they will eventually be required to register and you're better off starting with an SEC compliant program at the outset. Um, and before we get into sort of the, the thinking just sort of about what's the present buzz and why, uh, just sort of a, a, a gut check of where we are, um, as of February 2016, there were over 3,200 exempt reporting advisors that report to the SEC. So that gets us to the question of what is this present buzz that is the subject matter and sort of the tagline that got people thinking about participating in today's webinar. Um, and the buzz is, you know, there seems to be some thinking at the SEC around departing from what was the, uh, the intent that was originally expressed in that June 2011 Dodd-Frank release. And you see it up on the screen where the SEC basically said, you know, they just didn't contemplate that its staff was going to conduct routine examinations, but rather they would go out and do what, for lack of a better term, would be something where, where it would be for, for cause, where you've got a tip, a complaint, a referral, something that is brought to the SEC's attention. Um, uh, notwithstanding what, what they said about the original intent, there's no doubt they had the power to examine them. So Dodd-Frank gave them the power to do it. And so what is this buzz? And this buzz, and you'll, you, to the extent that you, you, you get regulatory updates from Cordium, you would have seen something in last November that reflected that there were a number of, of industry sources out there reporting that a, a particular individual named Mark Wyatt, who is the director of the SEC Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations, which people will generally refer to as the term OC, made comments at an industry event that seemed to state that it indicated that OC staff is now examining ERAs as a routine matter. Um, these are all in reports. There has been, to the best of our knowledge, no official statement from the SEC on that. But it, it does, based on that comment, make one believe that they are actually going out and doing those exams as a sort of regular or routine manner. Um, so I said no official statements, but you got to remember the SEC does have quite a bit of resources dedicated in the private fund space. They have a dedicated private fund unit. And sort of what else when you read this sort of buzz together, which would make you think, hey, is, is there some likelihood? Well, they've ramped up their resources in a big way. Uh, um, you know, we've got just, just this past February, last month, there are quite a few media reports out there that the SEC is adding 100 new IA examiners. Um, and that includes not only new hires, but they didn't hire 100 new. They are reallocated from the BD examiner ranks. There's been quite a few reports saying that the SEC is taking its BD examiner ranks and retraining them to be IA examiners. And they are sort of reallocating responsibility to examine broker dealers over to FINRA, which is the self-regulatory organization for broker dealers. If you combine that with the 70 new examiners that were hired in 2015, you've got a total increase of about 35% to 630 examiners. Again, it is not specifically linked to a stated official desire 
to examine exempt reporting advisors. It's just reflective of the fact that they've got a bigger team, their ability, they've got the ability to handle a larger number of exams, and as I said, we've got these statements from the, the head of OC saying that they are going to start examining ERAs as a routine, uh, uh, routine manner. Um, so where does that take us now that I guess I've gone through the sort of scary intro um, um, uh, uh, um, portion of it? And before I do that, I'll just say it looks like I've got a question here. Uh, what does IA and BD? IA means uh, exempt. Uh, sorry, IA means an investment advisor, and BD means a broker dealer. Sorry for using those uh, terms without defining them. So now that I mentioned, we sort of went through this scary intro section of it. Um, uh, let's sort of walk through, and, and we don't know that ERAs or all ERAs are going to be subject to routine exams, but what normally occurs in a, a routine exam? And I would say at the outset, we're going to review through what is normal and what you can normally expect in a routine exam, you know, from the perspective of our experience working with actual registered uh, investment advisors. And I'll try to call out spots where we think, frankly, there would be some differentials for exempt reporting advisors. So we're going to, we're really going to sort of, so First, how does it start? Usually you're going to get some sort of a notification, usually phone, email, and you're going to get what is usually a relatively standardized request letter telling you you're going to be subject to an exam. It might, um, it might at the outset, there might be some, there will be some logistics involved. Um, we'll talk about a little bit later how much notice you get, but figuring out what it will start. Now we'll sort of go through what the life of an exam looks like, and we'll, we'll talk about, obviously, um, uh, document production, time and duration, the on-site visit, and what is included after uh, the, the visit. So what is generally required to be produced from a document production standpoint? I guess generally what we'll see, and it, there's sort of been a bit of a, of a, of a, of a evolution of, the, of the, the SEC and their OC examination staff uh, where we were seeing, and, and people might be remember it, in Dodd-Frank there was sort of these presence exam initiatives where there was quite a bit of focus on risk-based exams. So you probably saw more narrow, limited focus exams where you're trying to very quickly try to get a handle on what kind of risk that you would see or what kind of risk a firm posed either by the types of securities it invested in, the types of clients it had, whatnot. Uh, part of that was much more limited because they wanted to examine a lot more advisors. So let's very quickly make a risk-based uh, evaluation on the firm and decide are we going to have a more uh, extensive examination or potentially a less extensive examination. So, but what you've seen in routine exams generally is, you know, 15 to 25 requests, maybe 40 to 50, um, um, you know, somewhere in that range. As he said, this is for SEC registered advisors. It's going to be quite a bit less for ERAs. That being said, there are some commonalities, and we think these would be extended, frankly, to what you would produce, what would be requested of an ERA, because, again, none of the categories on, on that bullet point list on slide 13 are necessarily limited to aspects of the Advisors Act that are not applicable to exempt reporting advisors. So they're going to definitely ask you for an org chart, uh, including ownership percentages and lists of affiliates. Um, they will likely ask you for your list of clients the type of clients, assets under management, the name of the custodian, the type of strategy, the type of fees. They're usually going to ask for all of these um, in, um, in a, uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. They're definitely going to ask you around your private funds, the number of investors, the domicile, master feeder. Again, a lot of that information is already going to be required to be reported by an exempt reporting advisor in item 7B of the ADV. So they're going to add that. To the extent you're a trading fund, they're going to ask you for a trade blotter, a list of JVs, uh, written policies and procedures, and again, as applicable to an exempt reporting advisor, any information about violations of policies, investor complaints, marketing materials, pitch books. So what are they not going to ask you for, obviously, as an ERA? Well, they're not going to ask you things that are not applicable. So they're not going to ask you about uh, record keeping around proxy voting. They're not going to ask you for record keeping around the personal trading of your access persons, again, because you're not technically required to have it. 
They're not going to ask you for record keeping around aspects of the art, the ADV that you are not required to complete. But I do think, and I think, again, all the, you know, we think these are likely areas to the extent that all of this buzz is correct and you could see exempt reporting advisors be subject to routine exams, the types of information that could be uh, requested. Um, what does the document production look like sort of during an exam? Um, you know, it could be anywhere from 5 to 10 to 20 to 30 in normal exams where they're going to say, hey, now the exam has started. We did the initial document production in, up front, but it's going to be, a, again, a lot less, a lot less, uh, 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 less in scope for your A's because, again, as he mentioned, there are a lot of aspects of record keeping and documents and whatnot that exempt reporting advisors are simply not required to keep. And we went over that earlier in, in the, the presentation. The one thing we would mention, and it's similar to the initial production of documents, is people should uh, be, frankly, um, uh, making sure that they are, um, you know, actually documenting their responses. So when you're asking for things uh, or they're asking you to produce documents, you, you sort of say, you've asked for X, here are the documents, here, how do we think it's applicable to us? And that should be the same thing that occurs during the course of an exam, you want these things documented. Um, and it looks like we've got a couple other questions I'll try to answer right now. Um, have there been instances where there are private equity funds are using the ERA exemption to avoid registration? Um, I, you know, I really don't know the answer to that question to the extent they were and they weren't good ERAs, that would be problematic to do that. Uh, we've got, and I, I think that's it. Let me uh, move back to the slides. Um, in production, and before I leave the area of document production, I think to the extent you are an ERA and similar to fully registered firms, everybody that's producing documents as part of um, um, an examination should really consider whether they should be, number one, speaking with attorneys about it, no doubt, using attorney-client privilege and thinking about Freedom of Information Act for documented or produced documents around bait stamping and other logistics. So that takes us um, to sort of uh, the question is, you know, again, before we, we, we leave this area is how far back will they look? Um, and we get a lot of questions about um, whether they'll go to information that predates registration. Um, our experience has been for fully SEC registered advisors as unfortunately, yes. Um, and then most people say, well, how do we respond to those? I think, um, 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 you know, uh, what should we do? Generally speaking, you know, definitely discuss with your counsel, but you really do want to get these exams off on the right foot. And if they're asking for documentation that is not otherwise, not otherwise problematic, documentation that you can easily obtain and produce, our advice usually is to go ahead and do that um, for that re very reason to make sure that you keep the exam on the right foot. But again, if you've got concerns about it, um, you've got questions, there have been issues that you've, de you've dealt with legal counsel on or compliance consultants, um, you know, I think at, at that point you should definitely be consulting uh, uh, those providers. Uh, that takes us to sort of the, the, the next sort of life of an exam piece, which is time and duration. Um, you know, again, I, I think generally speaking, when you're doing routine exams, how much notice are you seeing? Generally speaking, you're, you're looking at four to seven days notice. That being said, we've seen outliers around the edges um, um, where you basically, uh, you've seen them give a couple of weeks or three weeks or four weeks notice. Um, you'll see this a bit more often when the examination staff is traveling in. So again, in certain areas of the country, uh, let's say for argument's sake, I believe Seattle is covered by San Francisco. So when you've got sort of logistics that need to be covered, sometimes you're seeing quite a bit more notice. Um, how long uh, should you expect the exam to last? Um, I think for, for on the on-site portion, you're probably thinking two to three days for a registered advisor, one that's fully registered. Again, less for an ERA. Um, that being said, you will see audits uh, that notwithstanding the fact that the uh, in this sort of new world, the on-site portion is a, a, a bit less. Um, they can stay open for a number of months, and a lot of the work will be done uh, remotely. Um, 
you'll see we mentioned here, and I think I'll mention a bit later in the process, but again, I think, um, you know, um, there, there is, we're going to talk about the, impro the importance of getting an exit interview as part of an examination. Um, so that takes us to sort of the next portion, you know, some, what are some big points when you're in that on-site visit, when they're there? Um, I would say unless there is really sort of an overwhelming reason or overriding reason to do it, don't try to delay these visits. Um, you know, you don't want to create the impression that there's something that you're worried about. Um, I also think clearly we always advise clients, you know, make sure you take the time to present your story on that first day. Take control of it. Be active. Be the one telling the story as opposed to responding things. Definitely prepare your partners and key people. Um, they're going to want to talk to them um, um, for having those types of interviews, and we'll talk about it in the prep piece uh, section a little bit later. How did that work? But some practical points: keep the office clean, file cabinets locked, no papers out, set up a clean, sterile room, a conference room for the advisors. Um, you know, to the extent you think there are issues that are out there, definitely try to get in front of your legal counsel and compliance consultants if you use them in advance to vet those issues. And from a practical point, uh, when you've got that on-site piece going and it's live back and forth questions and answers, it is really, really important to ensure that you know the concept that I don't know is an okay answer or I will check on it. Um, there is a natural inclination for people to try to answer questions they don't necessarily know the answer to and sometimes that can get you in a pickle. Um, and I think if you're not absolutely sure about answers, Go out and ask questions. Go out, call your legal counsel, call your compliance consultants, get other members of your compliance or ops team in place to make sure you can answer that question. And that takes us sort of to the to the the, the, the final piece of sort of the life of an audit um, is after the on-site and what happens. And I mentioned it a bit earlier. I think to the extent uh, you are an ERA, and this, this buzz that we're talking about is correct, and we see more of it, that you get examined. It is very, very important, I think, for firms to request an exit interview at some point in the process, whether that's before they leave the on-site uh, or it can be done remotely over the phone before they close the audit out. And the reason for that is you will then get first-hand feedback on what are they finding, what are the issues they're noting. Uh, why is that really important? It's really important because number one, they may be noting issues that are not accurate, and you could either you can you can help them understand or clarify them for them. It's not an issue. If arguably there are small issues that can be remedied relatively quickly, you will know about them in advance of the letter. And why is that important? Well, if you have this exit interview and you know they found one, two, three, four issues, whatever it is and you know a number of them, you immediately can devise, as I said, remedies for them. Well, what you will do is between the time of that X interview and the time you actually potentially will get what is called that deficiency letter, you will take those steps to remedy it. And you will proactively send a letter to the SEC between that time period saying, hey, it was great speaking with you at our X interview, blank, blank, and blank, either on the phone or in person. You noted a number of issues. We went out and did X, Y, and Z, and we proactively addressed them. Why is that so important? Because at some point in that process, right, you're going to get, as you can see on the screen now, that deficiency or findings letter. They may not find anything, but if they do, and to the extent that you have already proactively communicated with them in that sort of a life of an audit, it will could end up in a situation where you don't have to have these things noted, right? They will not only say to you, wow, hey, we noted these issues, but they'll note in the letter that, hey, you are actually doing X, Y, Z and address of them, which is makes it really great because, again, at some point, right, you're likely going to have an investor request to see a copy of that letter. That's a whole other ball of wax whether you decide to give it to them or not, but there are a lot of firms that do, and it will basically tell the whole story within the body of the letter. Uh, we had this audit exam. You know, this is what the issue was noted. This is what we did about it. So they naturally know that you've actually proactively gone out and corrected. Um, again, I think just sort of going through the, 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 the life of an exam, uh, which is what we're trying to do in this part of the presentation, 
I have to say that, you know, there is always the possibility, right, that if there are really big deficiencies that are found, the SEC could, in theory, refer those problems to the Division of Enforcement. Hopefully, you're not actually going to see that. So we've sort of walked you through what a routine exam looks like, how most registered advisors deal with it, how mechanically they deal with it. So really, what should you or should your firm as an exempt uh, reporting advisor think about doing now? You know, I guess we would advise and I'd, I'd advise you to do the same things, frankly, that you see um, um, registered advisors do. Go for practice. Run through a live exercise. Get yourself a copy of what an, a routine letter looks like figure out what are, would not be applicable to you as a function of, of, of being an exempt reporting advisor as opposed to um, a fully registered advisor and run through either a mock audit or order prep exercise. Part of that should definitely be interviewing your key people. Um, without a doubt, I, I, I really want to emphasize the importance of that because there's no doubt they're going to want to interview people, your, 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 you know, your PM, your CIO, your COO, if you have a CCO, your CFO, and why do you want to do that or potentially have somebody do it? Because it's better for you to see that in a mock environment, right, or in a practice environment, because you might find that some of the key people at your firm just say things that make you want to pull your hair out and really sort of put the firm in a bad light and, and maybe make things look bad when they're really not bad, and you could sort of fix that through the process. And potentially you could also – Carve out people to say, look, you know, unless we're actually pushed on this, we're not going to put, you know, you know, Jane Doe in front of the examiners because of the way that she unfortunately comes off in an interview. So that's really important. The other thing is create a first day presentation. We talked about this earlier. It's, it's about telling your story and think about if my shop, my exempt reporting advisor is chosen for an examination. How would I tell the story of the business, what we do, who we are, what's our strategy, what do we see as risks in the world, what are our internal control, control procedures, why do we have these procedures and not other procedures, and really control the dialogue. As they say, you tell the story as opposed to them coming in, and especially, too, it's very important on this interview point I made earlier, because if you prepare what's called this sort of first day presentation, you arguably could get maybe somebody that doesn't didn't do so well in the interview format, and they together maybe with the regulatory contact or if you, you are an ERA that is appointed a CCO, you can run through that first day presentation. So you've made them available, but you really haven't necessarily subjected it to a, a line of questions. You've allowed them to go through a presentation where they're proactively telling the story of the firm, of their strategies, of how they view risk and how they run sort of a compliance control environment. Um, you should definitely be working on um, proactively identifying conflicts of interest, um, you know, um, identifying gaps and problems in your system against the procedures you've already, you know, adopted. Um, to the extent, again, you've ad adopted even a limited form compliance manual just applicable to an ERA, you should make sure everything that we said we're doing, are we doing? Did we register as an ERA in 2012 and adopt something that was provided to us by a service provider and really not do anything thereafter. You should make sure you're doing it even at that limited scale. Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, be really sort of careful and think about using it as an opportunity, maybe the exercise of being prepared to be in front of the SEC is reviewing those marketing materials. You know, are they getting reviewed by outside legal counsel? Are they getting reviewed by compliance personnel? Are they, you know, or are, are, have you had any issues in the past that maybe you want to think about in, in sort of, preparing for a potential exam, um, and then also, you know, conducting periodic training for your staff. So to say, look, you know, we don't know for sure. We haven't seen an official statement from the SEC, but, you know, we're thinking that there arguably is, you know, a higher likelihood of us potentially getting a routine exam, and we need to know that we're going to do this, and, you know, potentially getting the staff trained to say, this is how we are going to want people to operate and conduct themselves and, and deal with an audit. And there's it, it, it's very important. I mean, I, I would say on the, 
among our clientele that's actually registered with the SEC, we spend a tremendous amount of time training staff members on what is going to happen in an audit, what's your role, what should you be doing, what should you not be doing, um, and, and that's very important. So I, I think what you, we've seen we've gone through on, on the agenda so far is really sort of, we, we've sort of gone through the regulatory landscape. I sort of went through this buzz and, and why there is potential talk about the possibility for routine exams for exempt reporting advisors. We, you know, we went through obviously the, the fact they're ramping up their resources. And then we went through the mechanics of what you can expect from a routine exam and what should an exempt reporting advisor do to prepare. That leaves us sort of with one thing to sort of, uh, you know, um, of, uh, to hit before we leave is from a substantive perspective, what do we think that would be the focus areas really from a substantive point if an exam goes live uh, for you? And, and I think those areas are going to be, number one, uh, sort of internal control procedures, conflicts of interest, hot areas that are out there is how you're allocating expenses, how you allocate investment opportunities in cybersecurity. And we'll take them sort of one by one, although I'm not going to do an in-depth sort of review of each one. But clearly, I, I, you know, notwithstanding the fact that there are large portions of the Advisors Act that ERAs are not required to comply with, they're going to want to see that you've got some sort of and preferably, although it's not stated, but I would, I'm would i going to say they're going to look for it, is written internal control compliance procedures. And at a minimum, they should reflect the fact that you are sensitized to what is required of an ERA and that you've adopted you know, insider trading, pay to play, which is around political contributions, um, general fiduciary, uh, duty to supervise and anti-fraud, because again, those are applicable areas. Um, you should make sure you actually are doing what you say you're going to do. I would say you should probably do some work to figure out are they best practice as compared to similarly situated ERAs. I mean, I think to some degree, I, I, I do think, you know, the, the bar is probably a bit raised on ERAs that are an ERA solely as a function of being a smaller advisor, i.e. less than $150 million. So I think if there is that possibility that you will become registered as your business grows, I would think that notwithstanding what they say about ERAs, you, your internal control procedures should reflect either what you are presently doing or what you will do as your assets under management increase and you potentially need to become fully registered when those rules will kick in. Um, and there should be a sense that you're reviewing it annually. And I would assume it's around the time of year that you, you are updating your, your sort of ERA reporting, you know, are you doing a review to ensure that you're still a good ERA? Um, next area is just hot button. And again, it's, it's the, you know, there is no specific rule at, under the Advisors Act that says, you know, you have to review conflicts. It's around a lot around your, sort of just your general fiduciary obligations, your duty to supervise and any fraud. But, you know, do you keep a running tally of what are the conflicts of interest in your business? You know, you know, you know, you know, again, you know, if you're a trading firm, notwithstanding the fact that you don't have to gather personal account statements, technically speaking, the personal trading activity of your personnel with knowledge of your portfolio is a conflict of interest. What are you doing around that? Um, you know, to the extent you have people at the firm that engage in outside business activities that may have a touch to investing, what are you doing about that? What are you doing about, you know, uh, you know, the fact that maybe some of your personnel might have outside relationships with vendors that you utilize, and especially vendors maybe that, that, that are paid by your fund or your client vehicles? Um, again, just really what are you doing? How do you go about identifying new conflicts of interest? And when you identify those conflicts of interest, how can you demonstrate that they're being addressed? Um, how are they being disclosed to investors? So the next couple of areas, again, I'm not going to, you know, I think you probably heard a lot about this is definitely a hot area, you know, of, of for firms in general. And I, 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 would, I would expect to the extent that an exempt reporting advisor did get a routine audit, this would be a hot area for them to look at is how you allocate expenses. If you've got multiple funds, so let's say you're, you've got, you know, two funds, each one of them have $60 million under management. There's a bit of overlap in the portfolio. How do you allocate expenses between the two of them? Is there areas where maybe there's joint expenses with service providers? 
Um, again, is it consistent with the way in which you say you're going to allocate expenses in your PPM or your limited partnership agreement? And that would be a split between the GP and the funds. And it, is it absolutely consistent in the way it's been disclosed? If not, why? Is it a normal error? Is it some systematic procedure that got put in place that shouldn't have been put in place? Again, it's an error you want to look at yourself, notwithstanding if you are a small shop. Definitely going to look on how it allocate, investment opportunities are allocated. Again, uh, this may be akin more to people, again, who have either multiple clients or maybe let's say they engage in a business that not only you know, makes fund investments but makes co-investments. How is that done? Is it reviewed for fairness? Um, how do you disclose, let's say, in a PPM that you're going to do it? Is it, again, is it consistent with that? Is there anything that somebody could look at in how those things are allocated that would be deemed to be unfair or inconsistent in how you disclose things? Definitely something to look at. And without a doubt, the last focus area is, that is going to be part of this type of review is going to be cybersecurity because it is a, an extremely, extremely hot topic with the SEC right now. They are doing sweep exams in that regard. And I would be surprised, frankly, if there was – if if an exempt reporting advisor did get um, – a routine exam that there wasn't some sort of inquiry around cybersecurity. And the stated focus areas for the SEC and cybersecurity are what you see up here is governance and risk assessment, uh, access rights and controls, data loss prevention, vendor management, training, um, both employees and vendors, and incident response. Um, they're going to want to see what are you doing in these areas and sort of Governance and risk assessment, again, is do you have written policies and procedures that ensure that you are addressing these focus areas? Um, are you periodically eval evaluating the risk? Because risks are changing year to year as things evolve, both from a technical perspective. Um, are the controls and processes tailored to your business? Is there anything that you do from an IT front that is somewhat unique that you need to have policies and procedures to ensure that you're addressing them? Um, and how is their communication between sort of the compliance, IT, cybersecurity, and senior management. Around access rights and controls, again, this is some basic stuff. I mean, how do you manage user, user credentials, authentication, authorization method, methods? Um, how are you dealing with remote access, customer logs and passwords, protocols, network segmentations, tiered access? Again, what is going on? There might be a lot going on, but it needs to be sort of uh, uh, arguably documented so that you can easily convey that to people. And my guess is you're going to not only need this for the SEC, but investors and OPDD and whatnot, um, you know, data loss prevention. Um, what are you doing there? What kind of controls are in place with respect to patch management, system configuration? Um, you know, um, are, are you monitoring for unauthorized data transfers? Um, and then vendor management. What are the, what are the OPDD sort of policies and procedures? What are you asking your vendors about cybersecurity. We can tell you at our firm, Cordium, that, that's becoming close to a full-time job is responding to not only our consulting clients but our software customers about all the things we do in that area. And then what kind of training are you providing to your employees? How do they know what not to open, what not to look at? You're training them around phishing emails. And then finally, incident response. God forbid something happens, what are you doing to go about doing it and where are the procedures that tell you exactly who should do what in what scenario. So with that, that is the close of our, the formal piece. Um, let me see if I've got some questions here that I will go through. Um, happy to answer any other questions. Uh, question, we've got a question here. How common is it to have ERA follow rules applicable to an SEC registered advisor? Um, to be honest, I think, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, I think it's quite common when you're dealing with exempt reporting advisors that I think are newly launched and they believe that they are, there is a relatively high likelihood that they will uh, raise assets in such a manner that they will go, uh, you know, be required to be registered. Uh, and for that reason, I, I think you'd probably say it's less common with exempt reporting advisors that are pure VC funds where they feel that the way they're going to operate their business, that they are not going to make investments that would not allow them to qualify for uh, the venture capital exemption. Got another question here around uh, how common is it for an 
exempt reporting advisor to appoint a CCO? I, again, same answer, I think, to a great degree. I think it's probably more common in the advisors that believe that they're eventually going to be uh, required to be registered as they grow their business and grow their assets under management. Um, and then we've got another question is, is archiving of emails required of ERAs? I mean, I think the answer to that question is a bit nuanced because I think, the, you know, most people look at registered advisors and say, you know, there is no rule per se that says you need to archive and back up your emails. There is a rule that says you are subject to a whole litany of record keeping requirements uh, that require you to keep certain records. And then as a practical point, uh, nine times out of ten, those written records are email because that is the, how the, you know, how it is documented, whether it's around personal trading, investment recommendations, proxy voting, you know, ADV brochure, whatever it is. And that's why there is, you know, it's such a large business of going out there. So I think the answer to that question would be that one would think that to the extent that, that email was the primary source of records around something that is applicable to an exempt reporting advisor, uh, one way or another, those things would need to be caught in the record. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to archive your emails, but you need to make sure that if they are boiling them down to writing, uh, and it is one of those limited areas that an ERA is required to comply with, um, you're going to want to cut, keep some record of that to demonstrate that you've got it. But again, it is much more limited. Um, so with that, actually, I think we are done. We're about 45 minutes in, and I know it's 5 o'clock on a Friday on the East Coast and 2 o'clock here on the West Coast. But I thank everybody for participating today. I thank you for all the good questions that you had. As I mentioned, um, we recorded this session. Um, and we're going to make the slides available and the recording available on our website, www.cordium.com. I uh, hope everybody has a good weekend. Thank you very much.